Hey there, welcome to Sweet Home Evangelical Church Online. I'm Pastor Brian, and it is Thanksgiving coming up this week. Uh, we, we have this day of gratitude where we are thankful and grateful for all that we have. And then we follow up this day of gratitude by a day of full contact Black Friday shopping. And it is, it, it is craziness. There's probably going to be a story of like, you know, maybe a, uh, a, a fist fight at a Walmart in Tennessee over $6 coffee makers or something like that. And, but before all the Black Friday fight shopping, uh, there will be this day of gratitude where we celebrate by eating too much with family. Today we're back in the book of Matthew. And, and we're looking at Family Feud today. The, the theme for today is Family Feud. And there is a Family Feud going on. There are struggles within Jesus' family. Uh, and we're, we're going to take, take a different approach today. We're going to look at uh, just the feud between the family of Jesus and the family of Herod. And Steve Harvey's not there to moderate uh, this, this family feud here. And uh, as we approach Thanksgiving, we think about family and family get-togethers. And, and sometimes you go every other year with family or, and things like that. And, and sometimes it gets tough. And we understand how getting together with family when you don't agree on things it gets tough and and we've uh and it was tough before covid covid just gave us a whole new list of things to disagree over but there are times when family disagrees you get together and it's tough and you know what jesus knew exactly what that was like he knew exactly what it was like uh for some people uh, thanksgiving just highlights and reminds us of the struggles and strained relationships with family. And Jesus knows what that's like. Today we're looking at some scripture that we don't really have teachings of Jesus here. It's not Jesus teaching us, here's how you should live. Uh, it's a, what it's called a narrative passage, where basically it just narrates and tells you, here's something that happened. Uh, the past, well, last week, Rob uh, Griffiths was here at the church, and, uh, but we had a few Sundays where we've been in Matthew 13, this, this chapter that's just full of parables. There was the parable of the sower and the four different kinds of dirt. Uh, there was the parable of the wheat and the weeds. A couple weeks ago, we kind of binge-watched a bunch of small parables, parable of uh, the treasure in the field, the pearl of great price, the mustard seed, and things like that. Now, uh, here we are, uh, we're, we're at the end of chapter 13, and chapter 13, remember, it started with what I call the Sermon on the Boat. Theologians don't call it this, this is just something I call it, but at the beginning of chapter 13, it says, all the crowds were around Jesus, he's by the Sea of Galilee, and they're really close, and so Jesus gets into a boat and preaches while he's sitting in a boat, while people are up on the shore there. And so uh, we've, we've got Jesus at the Sea of Galilee preaching the Sermon on the Boat. And then there's this transition that takes place. Uh, the sea, he was at the Sea of Galilee, probably like the north, northeast side of the Sea of Galilee, probably around Capernaum, which was home base for Jesus. That was the hometown of uh, Peter and Andrew, James and John, the fishermen disciples. And, and, and then we get to Matthew uh, chapter 13, verse 53, and it says, When Jesus had finished telling these parables and illustrations, he left that part of the country. He returned to Nazareth, his hometown, where he uh, when he taught there in the synagogue, everyone was amazed and said, Where does he get this wisdom and power to do miracles? Then they scoffed, He's just the carpenter's son. We know Mary, his mother, and his brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, and Jude. All of his sisters live right here among us. Where did he learn all these things? And they were deeply offended and refused to believe him. Then Jesus told them, A prophet is honored everywhere except in his hometown and among his own family. And so he did only a few miracles because of their unbelief. Things didn't quite work out so well in his hometown. 
Uh, it's about, uh, about 40 miles from Capernaum, there on the Sea of Galilee, to his hometown of Nazareth. It's not, you know, it's not that far. However, you know, you're walking. So 40 miles is, is a long ways for me to walk. It would take me quite a while. <laughs> and uh, there is a hiking trail that some tourists uh, go on this trail, even when they go to Israel these days. Uh, it's called the Gospel Trail, and it is a meaningful trip for people who do this because you are walking the trail that Jesus would have walked between his hometown of Nazareth and Capernaum. Here in Matthew, it mentions the family of Jesus. Uh, our, our Catholic friends, they, you know, this is, a, this is one of those disputed passages with our Catholic friends. Uh, the, the official belief of the Catholic Church is in the perpetual virginity of Mary, the mother of Jesus. And so well, they, they, they aren't quite sure if these are uh, Jesus, uh, when it says brothers, if they're literal brothers or cousins or sons of Joseph from an earlier marriage or something. Uh, however, on the evangelical side, we just kind of assume, hey, Mary and Joseph had kids after Jesus, and these are his brothers and sisters. So there's that difference of opinion, but, you know, we, we're looking at, you know, we're, we're just going to kind of assume that these are brothers of Jesus. And we know from other passages that Jesus' brothers were not on board with his teaching ministry. Jesus goes to Nazareth, his hometown, small little village, and they didn't believe him. It says they were deeply offended, and Jesus only did a few miracles there. Why? Because a miracle is an act of God, but it also depends to a degree somehow on our faith. And, and they didn't believe in Jesus in his hometown. Now here's Jesus, he's attracting big crowds, he even has Roman centurions coming to see him, yet at his hometown, they still treated him like, come on, it's just Jesus, it's no big deal, it's just Jesus. Now let's look at the Herod family. This passage here uh, will be a, there's, I'm gonna read here in the first part of chapter 14, there's going to be a bit of a flashback. You know how flashback episodes go from TV and movies and stuff. So that's going to happen here. So I'm going to read, uh, let's see, Matthew chapter 14, verse 1. When Herod Antipas, the ruler of Galilee, heard about Jesus, he said to his advisors, this must be John the Baptist raised from the dead. This is why he can do such miracles. For Herod had arrested and imprisoned John as a favor to his wife Herodias, the former wife of Herod's brother Philip. And then we do the flashback here. John had been telling Herod, it is against God's law for you to marry her. Herod wanted to kill John, but was afraid of a riot because all the people believed John was a prophet. But at a birthday party for Herod, Herodias' daughter performed a dance that greatly pleased him, so he promised with a vow to give her anything she wanted. At her mother's urging, the girl said, I want the head of John the Baptist on a tray. Then the king regretted what he had said uh, uh, in front of his guests, and he, as he, but he issued the necessary orders. So John was beheaded in prison, and his head was brought on a tray and given to the girl who took it to her mother. Later, John's disciples came for his body and buried it, and they went and told Jesus what happened. Okay, so here's Herod, and he thinks that Jesus is like, you know, the ghost of John the Baptist who he had killed at some point a little bit earlier. We got this flashback of explaining how John was executed and why and how that came about. Now, we're going to look at the family feud between the, the Herod family and the family of Jesus. Uh, I don't really have an outline for you. I'm not going to put it all on the screen for you. Uh, probably not. We'll see. <laughs> but uh, uh, because I have a 12-point outline today, and it's not really blanks to fill in and stuff, I got a 12-point outline just to keep myself on track here today. But I got 12, 12 points on this family feud between the house of Herod and the house of Jesus. Number one, Jesus was the king of the Jews. The Herods were not even Jewish. 
Uh, the Gospel of Matthew, it opens up with a genealogy of Jesus, starting with Abraham all the way down to Jesus. The Gospels uh, of uh, Matthew and Luke, they have these genealogies. Now, Matthew, it, it starts with Father Abraham and goes down to Jesus. The Gospel of Luke starts with Jesus and then works its way backwards, uh, backwards to King David and to Father Abraham and even back to Noah and Adam. And both of these genealogies are in the Bible to establish that Jesus was very Jewish. He was a descendant of Father Abraham. He's Jewish. He was a descendant of King David. He is king of the Jews. Yet the Herods, they were the kings. Herod the Great was the king when Jesus was born. We're going to talk about that next month. Christmas is coming. I'm sure we'll get to Herod at some point. Herod uh, had palaces in Jerusalem and Masada and on the, uh, on the coast. However, Herod was only king because he had the favor of the Roman Empire. The Herods, uh, when Herod built a palace and, and essentially built a town from scratch on the Mediterranean coast there, uh, he named the place Caesarea, trying to flatter the Caesar. Uh, Herod was basically a governor appointed by the Roman Empire. And Herod wasn't even Jewish. Herod the Great's dad was from Idumea, which in the Old Testament they called that place Edom. Uh, these, the people of Edom, they were descendants of Esau. Esau was the grandson of Abraham. Uh, Abraham had a son, Isaac. Isaac had twin boys, Jacob and Esau. Jacob is the one that God chose uh, the line to go through, and Esau, not so much. Uh, it, we're going to, in our Bible reading plan, uh, at the end of this week, we're going to be in the book of Malachi. And the book of Malachi opens where God talks about how he chose Jacob and rejected Esau. And uh, so we've got... From Jacob, there's the 12 tribes of Israel. They receive the covenant on Mount Sinai. They're given the promised land. Esau was not chosen. Jesus was from the line of God's chosen people, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Herod, well, he was from Esau. And he may have been called a king, but he was not even part of the chosen people. Number two, Jesus was born in a barn Herod was born in a palace. Next month, we're going to do Christmas, the birth of Jesus. This, this guy here in Matthew 14 is Herod Antipas. Herod Antipas was one of the seven sons of Herod the Great. Uh, the Herods were ruling over Israel. They had the best their world had to offer. The Herod kids were born into a palace, born into privilege. And Jesus, the Son of God, had a different story. Because of the circumstances of his birth, Jesus was ignored by the extended family. There was no room for them in the inn. Jesus was not born into privilege or even into middle class. He was born in a smelly barn and placed in a feeding trough as a newborn baby. Number three, the wise men, they brought gifts to Jesus. There were no presents for the Herod kids. Herod Antipas was about uh, 20 years old uh, when uh, Jesus was born. Herod Antipas was one of the younger sons of Herod the Great. In Matthew chapter 2, we see the story of the wise men showing up, coming from the east. It's a, it's a weird, strange story because they're not Jewish. They're from the east, like Persia area or something like that. And uh, maybe they got a copy of the scriptures when when the children of Israel were carried off into captivity to Babylon and Persia many years earlier. And they had been studying the scriptures and studying the stars, and they show up looking for the newborn king. And they go to Herod's house, but they know this isn't quite right. None of the Herod kids are the newborn king. And then they have to check the records and they get the research guys out and they, they look it up and the Old Testament prophets say, nope, the, uh, the, the newborn king, the Messiah is born in Bethlehem. And so it wasn't going to be any of the kids or grandkids of Herod the Great. Uh, the, it was someone born in Bethlehem. 
The wise men knew right away it was nobody from the family of Herod. So no presents for any of the kids or grandkids of Herod. The promised Messiah was in Bethlehem. They go to Bethlehem and they found the baby Jesus and Mary and Joseph. These wise men, they brought gifts and worshiped. The house of Jesus was honored. The house of Herod was rejected. No presents, not even a lump of coal. Number four, Jesus grew up poor. The Herods grew up kind of rich in their society. The Herod family was part of the ruling elite, and many of the Herod boys went to college in Rome. Uh, it's kind of like, you know, I send, you know, rich families sending their kids off to an Ivy League school <coughs> and belonging to a fraternity. It's not so much the good education, but also the, the friendships and connections to get ahead in life. After Herod the Great died, there were a few changes. There was what was known as the Tetrarchy. Uh, instead of Herod the Great's monarchy, it was divided up into four different sections. They called it the Tetrarchy. And Pontius Pilate was, had one of these four sections. Uh, a couple of the Herod boys, they had other sections. They were rulers. They were in charge. Jesus grew up poor. After the wise men visited Mary and Joseph, they went to Egypt for a while, then they go back to Nazareth, the northern part of Israel at the time, in Nazareth there. It's, and it was, you know, it was considered kind of the, you know, the hillbilly redneck area of Israel at the time, clear out there in the sticks as compared to the big city of Jerusalem. It's kind of the difference between Portland and Sweet Home. You got the big city, and then you got the small town. And, and the, the big city, they, you know, they would look down on the small town if they even knew where it was. And, he, and Jesus, you know, he, he grew up poor in the village of Nazareth, and Nazareth didn't even have a great reputation. Remember when Jesus was getting his first disciples in the Gospel of John chapter 1, it talks about, you know, we're, we're getting the, the disciples here, kind of assembling the team. And um, uh, Philip, he goes to tell his friend Nathaniel. He says, hey, we found the guy. We found, I'm pretty sure, I think he could be the Messiah. You got to come see him. And Nathaniel says, well, who is this guy? And Philip says, it's Jesus of Nazareth. And, and Nathaniel goes, come on, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Yeah, Jesus grew up in a town that nobody had any respect for. Poor little dirt water town. Number five, Nazareth rejected Jesus. Even poor little Nazareth, they thought Jesus wasn't good enough for them. They rejected Jesus. The Herods, they didn't tolerate rejection well. When I lived in Iowa, uh, I knew I wouldn't live there forever, so I, I tried to see the sights in Iowa, kind of being a tourist in the Midwest. Uh, I went to Winterset, Iowa, and they have the house where John Wayne was born. So that was awesome, and I did the tour through the John Wayne house. Uh, I worked uh, a little bit in a town called Pella, Iowa. That's where they make the Pella windows, but also in Pella, Iowa, uh, that is the hometown where Wyatt Earp grew up when he was a kid. Uh, oh, shoot out at the OK Corral, Wyatt Earp. And these towns are proud of their, you know, people who grew up in their towns. Jesus did not get that kind of hometown treatment. They were not simply skeptical of Jesus as a possible Messiah. It says in chapter 13, verse 57, and they were deeply offended and refused to believe him. They'd known Jesus since he was a kid. They know his family, and they're, you know, they're okay people, but this is not the kind of Messiah that we're looking for. And they rejected the idea that Jesus could even possibly be the Messiah. It was offensive to them. The Herods, they didn't deal with rejection well. Herod the Great, remember, he had all the babies killed in Bethlehem. Herod Antipas, he didn't like what John the Baptist was saying about him, so he had him arrested, thrown in prison, violating his right to free speech, right? Number six, John the Baptist was a cousin of Jesus. However, John the Baptist was imprisoned by the Herods. 
John the Baptist was the one person in Jesus' family that believed in him. Uh, John and Jesus, they were cousins. Maybe they grew up having family Thanksgiving together or something like that. Remember uh, when John was out there preaching away, he's preaching at the Jordan River, calling people to repentance. He's baptizing people. And Jesus shows up and John says, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. John, this cousin of Jesus, spoke out against Herod Antipas, who had married his brother's wife. And the Herod family didn't really like, like John pointing that out. If this happened today, the Herods would have pressured the media and the big tech companies to bury the story. Instead, they just threw John in prison. Number seven, the brothers of Jesus they didn't believe Jesus. They, they just, his brothers didn't believe. Herod, he married his brother's wife. So <laughs> there's brother issues here. Herod Antipas, his wife's name was Herodias. Now, I got a friend of mine named Dan. Dan married a girl named Danette. That was a happy coincidence. It was way too cute. It was weird. And so Dan and Danette. Here is Herod and Herodias, but it wasn't a coincidence. Herodias was a granddaughter of Herod the Great. Her dad was a brother of Herod Antipas. She had married her uncle Philip, but she and Herod Antipas had an affair. As a result, they both divorced their spouses and married each other. So here is Herodias, who married not one, but two of her uncles. John spoke out against this, and what do you know? She didn't like it. And she pressed to have John arrested. She wanted him killed. Jesus' brothers, well, they weren't, they weren't that bad, okay? When you compare to the Herod family, they weren't that bad, but they did not believe in Jesus. They didn't believe. We see them showing up a couple times in the Gospels, and they were never on board with Jesus and all of the crowds and miracles and teachings and everything. They, they just weren't supportive. It says real plainly in John chapter 7, verse 5, for even his brothers didn't believe him. John 7, 5, even his brothers didn't believe him. Now, maybe you have close family that don't follow Jesus. And Thanksgiving gets a little awkward at times. It's painful. It's discouraging. I get it. And you know what? Jesus knows exactly that pain and awkward frustration. He knows what that's like because even Jesus' own brothers didn't believe in him. Number eight, Jesus taught righteousness. Herod was not righteous. Okay. <laughs> one taught righteous. The other one was not righteous. Jesus lived a sinless life. He taught righteousness. Some people say that they like Jesus. A lot of people in this world, they say they like Jesus. Uh, you know, he's a nice guy, but they ignore all the things he taught. Over and over again during the Sermon on the Mount, this famous landmark long sermon that Jesus preached, over and over Jesus says, you have heard it said, but I say, Jesus says, here is the law of Moses. Here is the law, but I say, you know, that's just a minimum, and we need to go to a higher standard. Uh, God is calling us to a higher level of righteous living. Jesus offers forgiveness for sin, but he never says, but it's okay, you can just keep on sinning. He never does that. Jesus offers forgiveness, but he doesn't say, oh, but don't worry about it. I'll just keep forgiving you. No, he calls us to righteous living. And here we have Herod, who is definitely not a righteous person. He married his brother's wife, who was another brother's daughter. That is awkward all around. How many different ways is he related to this woman, Herodias? And then what happens here in Matthew 14? We have a story of kind of incest and a really creepy, pervy guy here. It says in chapter 6, At a birthday party for Herod, 
Herodias' daughter performed a dance that greatly pleased him, and so he promised with a vow to give her anything she wanted. It says in the Gospel of Mark, it says that uh, Herod said he would give her anything up to half the kingdom. This seems a bit creepy here that uh, she is doing an exotic dance for her stepdad, uncle type of guy here, and he is so uh, excited about this exotic dance that he's willing to give her anything. That is just plain creepy all around. Jesus taught righteousness. Herod was not righteous. Number nine, Herod had killed John, and Jesus lamented the loss of John. It, it seems like the mom is the one pulling the strings in this family. She wanted the head of John the Baptist on a platter. After her daughter does her sexy dance, I guess, then she goes to her mom, okay, what do we get out of him? And she wants the head of John the Baptist, so Herod does, just to keep the women happy. In Matthew 11, Jesus, uh, John was in jail, and Jesus comments, and he says, there's no one greater than John the Baptist. And he mourns the loss of John. In chapter 14, it says uh, that uh, John's disciples come and tell Jesus. Jesus is sad, and he just wants to be alone, and he needs a break from the crowds, and we're going to see how that turns out for him next week. The family of Jesus, though, they came to believe. It took them a little while, but they came to believe. The Herod family, they continued the feud. Uh, Jesus' family, they came to believe in him, but the Herod family, they kept the family feud going. It says in Acts chapter 1, after the resurrection and ascension of Jesus, the 11 remaining disciples, plus Jesus' mom Mary, and the brothers of Jesus all met together and stayed together for several days in prayer. In 1 Corinthians, it, it mentions that the resurrected Jesus appeared not just to the disciples, but also to his brother, James. Acts chapter 12, there's another member of the Herod family, Herod Agrippa. Herod Agrippa was a grandson of Herod the Great. He's just another one of the Herod family, and he was in charge in Jerusalem at that time. And... You know, the Pharisees were upset about these Christians, and so Agrippa has James killed. James, the disciple. James, the brother of John. James and John, the sons of thunder, the sons of Zebedee. And he has James killed, and he throws Peter in prison. And uh, later in the book of Acts, it talks about another James. Uh, in Acts chapter uh, 12, James the disciple was killed, but in Acts chapter 15, we're talking about James, but this is James the brother of Jesus, who really appears to be in charge there at the church in Jerusalem. We have Peter there, and Peter's talking, but everybody's looking to James for leadership. James came to believe. James wrote the book of James. And then there's this tiny little book, second to last book in the Bible, the book of Jude, written by another brother of Jesus. The family of Jesus did come to believe. Number 11, the Herods ruled Israel. They ruled in Israel. But Jesus didn't come to rule, he came to serve. Herod family, they ruled Israel for generations. Whether it was Herod the Great uh, or his sons Antipas and Philip, or grandson Agrippa. There was even a granddaughter who married uh, one of the Roman officials, uh, married Felix. Uh, we see him later on in the book of Acts. Jesus didn't come to rule, he came to serve. It says in Matthew 20, verse 28, for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus didn't come to rule. He came to serve and give his life as a ransom for all of us. He did that so we could also be a part of the family of Jesus. 
because we're not getting into the family of Herod. Number 12, my last point here in, in all of this muddled message, the Herod family judged the family of Jesus. But one day, Jesus will be the judge. The Herod family did their judging in this world, but one day Jesus will be the judge. Herod the Great tried to kill Jesus as a baby. His son, Herod Antipas, judge John the Baptist, had him executed. After Jesus was arrested by the Pharisees and chief priests, he's sent to Pilate. Pilate sends him to Herod, this same Herod Antipas. Herod Antipas doesn't let him go. He sends him back to Pilate. Uh, <laughs> Another of the Herods, they killed Jesus' friend James, the brother of John, puts Peter in prison. But when we read the book of Revelation, one day Jesus will be the judge of all the Herods in this world. He will be the judge of all people. Don't waste your time on the temporary. The Herods, like many in this world, they come and go. They, they live for themselves, they do what pleases them, they do what benefits themselves, and they could care less about what, what other people think. They just are living for themselves. However, we look forward to that day, because if we've placed our faith in Jesus, our names are written in the book. Our names are written in that book that, that says that we are now part of the family of Jesus. We're no longer part of the family of Herod. We're part of the family of Jesus, and that's the side of the, we want to be on in this family feud. Jesus said, whoever does the will of the Father is his brother and sister. We are adopted into the family of Jesus when we place our faith in him rather than placing our faith in the Herods of this world. Oh, the uh, Gaithers. Uh, they, my parents loved the Gaithers. They were real big uh, when I was a little kid. And uh, the Gaithers had a song, I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. It is true. And you can be part of the family of God. There is a family feud that's always taking place between the house of Herod and the house of Jesus. The Herods are the ones that rule this world and rule by fear and intimidation. But we can be adopted into the family of God when you place your faith in Jesus. That is good news for us. If you haven't done that, you need to do that today. If you've done that, we thank Jesus for it. We are, that is the thing we are most thankful for this Thanksgiving week. Let me pray for you. Lord Jesus, we thank you that we can be adopted into your family. We thank you for how you have blessed us beyond measure. We thank you that um, it is made possible that we can be forgiven of our sin, that we can join you in your eternal home in heaven when our days are over here on earth. Lord God, I pray for those listening right now that you would grant them your grace, that they could look to you, turn to you, and be grateful for all you've done. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, Lord bless you. Thanks for joining me. Have a great Thanksgiving this week. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.